On January 17, 1969, a fighter pilot ejected near the border of North Vietnam and Laos. The series of events that followed are almost beyond belief. The high-speed ejection had caused my limbs to flail so violently that uh, both elbows were dislocated and the forearms were pushed about halfway up on the inside of each arm. It's a story of tragedy, courage, and valor told by the men who lived through two of the most infamous days of the Vietnam Air War. 3.30 in the morning, my alarm went off, and I got out for one of the damnedest days I ever saw in my whole life. Harry is a podcast that tells this incredible story. Search Harry, H-A-I-R-Y, on all major platforms or on our website, www.harrystories.com. the uh, show. Thank you once again. This is uh, Boat signing off for uh, Bomber Month 2020. We'll look to do this again next year in 2021. And with that, Jello, back to you. Well, thanks, Boat. And great job on Bomber Month this year. We'll certainly look forward to doing that again next year. But in the meantime, let's get back to naval aviation this week with a discussion on the longest consecutively serving carrier-based aircraft in U.S. Navy history. Call it the Hawkeye, the Hummer, or the Eyes of the Fleet, just don't call it an AWACS, as we'll learn from our two guests, a former E-2 Hawkeye test pilot and a naval flight officer who returns from our air intercept communications episode. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here is your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Well, happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to episode 99 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. 99, holy smokes. Yep, that's right. We're almost up to 100, and we will be celebrating that milestone at the end of the year. I am your host, Jello, and we will get to our feature interview on the E2 Hawkeye with Jonathan Ulbricht in a bit, and our old friend Niles will be along shortly to help out. Anyway, it's been a little while since we've chatted. Hope everyone is doing well and had a good Thanksgiving. We certainly enjoyed Bomber Month. We hope you did too. And I thought Boat did a really nice job. So if you like him, I guess we'll keep him around. Thanks, Boat. <laughs> anyway, as we've said before, he is going to look to do some more Warbird episodes. So we'll be featuring those, we hope, in 2021. Well, let's see. What's new since we've talked last? Uh, we released a blog early in the month, back in November, that is, musing about aircraft nomenclature. And then later, our partner, Rich Cooper, released an article about the Avro Vulcan shortly after that episode aired. You can check both of those out on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com, and then click on musings. And by the way, while you're there, click on the shop link where you can find an assortment of military aviation themed books and apparel just in time for the holidays. And if you don't want to shop for yourself, well, send the link to a loved one and I'm sure they can pick out some cool gear or a great book for you. In case you missed it, we also released a video update on our YouTube channel about the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and their ongoing transition to the Super Hornet. We had two recent flight leaders, Ryan Bernacki and Eric Doyle, who came on the show. We talked via Zoom, and it had an accompanying audio-only podcast episode. If you're subscribed to the show, you probably know all this, but we had a really great discussion and churned some uh, real good discussion on YouTube about what's going to be different and what's going to be the same when the Blue Angels return in 2021 in the FA-18 E and F Super Hornet. And let's hope there's an air show season to return to, all right? All right, uh, let's see. New Patreon strike lead this time is Lois Hammond. We want to thank Lois. And we just got that out of the way in case we forget later. And then those of you who are longtime listeners, you might recall since COVID started back in the spring of this year that I've been through some ups and downs and some drama with my airline job. Well, first I thought I was going to be furloughed, then I thought I was going to be okay, then I thought I was going to stay in LA. Well, the latest is they want me to move to New York City and fly the Airbus 220. And you know what? I don't know. I don't think I want to commute from San Diego to New York. 
and fly an airplane that isn't based in LA. So I don't know, I might take a leave of absence and do more full-time podcasting. And we're also working on a new show that we've mentioned before. Probably could get on YouTube a bit more as well and try to supplement income that way. But the drama continues. And for those of you who are concerned and like to follow my plight, I do appreciate all the support. And, you know, I'm just lucky at this point to have a job. And so it is what it is. Anyway, let's take a few listener questions. We have a little time. It is a longer interview this week, but hey, why don't we get through a couple because I know you've been waiting. The first is a phone call. David Neal, French in Missouri. Just wondering if y'all are going to do a episode on the heavy bomber B-36. You've been doing a lot of heavy bomber episodes, but the B-36 was uh, in term between World War II and the B-52 age. Very interesting aircraft, but I haven't heard you mention it. Just wanted to call your attention to it because I know a lot of those guys are getting few and far between that actually uh, served on the B-36. Appreciate your input. Love your show. All right, David. Well, your phone call question is perfectly timed. We tried to get a B-36 for this year's Bomber Month, but it didn't quite work out. And so we're looking to find some experts on the B-36, and we'll see if we can't get someone to come along next year and talk about the Peacemaker in Bomber Month 2021. So apologies for this year, but stay tuned, and we'll see if we can hit it next year. All right, next up is an email from John who says, I do a lot of strength and conditioning work with athletes and was wondering, given the demands of the body to pull high Gs, what is your workout plan? Is it like sports where a strength and conditioning coach would prescribe a program or is it up to each guy to just make sure they are prepared? Would it be different for guys and fighters pulling high Gs versus other pilots who don't but may have unique demands such as longer flights? Would love to hear the details. And then John continues, uh, do you guys squat? deadlift, etc. What are rep ranges, aerobic conditioning, anaerobic. So yes, yes, and yes, John. So first off, the Blue Angels, as I recall from a documentary I watched on them a long time ago, during their winter training in El Centro, I think they do have a trainer or somebody who's helping them. And they have very concentrated workouts because of their short duration, high intensity flights. Now, certainly that is different than someone who's going to be on a long, let's say P3 or P8 or E6 mission, where you want to make sure you have stamina and you stay well hydrated. But Yes, you're right. It's up to everybody. And all we have to do is make sure we can pass the minimum physical standards that the Navy sets. And it's a so many push-ups, depending on your age and gender, so many sit-ups, both of those are in a two minute limit. And then you have to either run or do uh, an elliptical or some other type of aerobic activity to make sure that you are fit. And then you also have some sort of uh, stretch and, and, you know, touch your toes kind of thing. But I think most people do more. Now, since you're asking, what do I do? I I alternate anaerobic anaerobic every day so back when gyms were open i used to like to lift weights and then on other days i would either run or more increasingly these days swim for me i would do between six and ten reps three sets and I like to try to use my own body weight. So push-ups, pull-ups, curl-ups, sit-ups, all those kinds of things. But I also did like to lift weights and standard core exercises are important. So yes, squats and deadlifts are good. But I also, of course, did a lot of the standard beach bod type stuff. So bench press and curls and different things. So, you know, I'm 50 now. I, I wouldn't call myself ripped, but I definitely keep in shape the best I can by alternating. And hey, I can still rock a Speedo at the beach. Okay, that's... That's disturbing. Anyway, good question, John. Uh, let's finish then with a, another phone call. Hello, this is Dan. I am a Maryland native, but calling from the Czech Republic. I was just recalling the episode on the F-14 Tomcat where it was mentioned that it actually uses spoilers to turn at lower speeds. And I thought that was quite interesting. That doesn't have any ailerons. I didn't know that. And it got me thinking how come not all aircraft just use spoilers or not all aircraft just use ailerons? How come some use a mix? What are the pros and cons of doing either, especially when it comes to fighter aircraft? So if you have any idea why not just the F-14, but maybe other aircraft would only use spoilers or ailerons, I would be super curious to know what you think. So thanks very much. Keep up the great work. Thanks for taking our questions. Take care. 
All right, Dan, thanks for the question. I didn't honestly know the answer to this one, so I had to put it to Reki, our resident test pilot expert. What she told me was, quote, it helps with dihedral effect for a quicker turn since ailerons can cause adverse yaw effects without a snappy roll with the design of the aircraft. So I think what she's getting at there is, as I mentioned, all aircraft are really a compromise of design. And once you start for example, putting on swing wings, well, then you have to see what that does and tests. Maybe ailerons are better than spoilers. Maybe horizontal stabilizers are better than the stabilators that we had on the F-18. And so they just go through iteration after iteration to find which one makes the most sense. And in this case on the Tomcat, they found that spoilers were better than ailerons. And I believe it was that way as well on the S3 Viking, as I recall. All right, well, that will do it for questions for this week then. Thanks very much. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our guest for today's discussion on the E-2 Hawkeye is a pilot. But as you'll soon learn during the interview, the airplane's mission is performed mainly by three naval flight officers in the back. So returning to the show is the star of episode 31 on air intercept communications, now Captain Alan Shafino. Welcome back to the show, Niles. Hey, thanks, Jello. It's good to be back here. Yeah, it's good to have you. And you're really going to help uh, fill in some of the blanks here on the E2 because I didn't know that much about it. And again, uh, our guest is up front. So anyway, what's new since we last heard from you? Gosh, it's been what, 68 episodes ago? Well, like you said, I am now a captain as of uh, very recently here. So I, congratulations. Thanks. Pinned that on and I uh, got to commit a little bit more of my life to the service for our great Navy. <laughs> well, good. I hope you're getting a little bit of pay with that too, but uh, I know that's not why you do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's exciting and it's an honor. So yeah. glad to be here. Outstanding. Good. All right. Well, so we're going to jump straight to the interview and uh, you were there as the listener will find out in a moment, but any thoughts about it before we roll tape, as we say? You know, I thought it was a pretty good, interesting discussion. We had that one episode uh, a while back talking about air intercept control, but uh, I think it was good to bring in a pilot so that we can hear how the whole thing works together. No doubt. If you put three NFOs in the back by themselves, uh, the plane doesn't go very far, so we need them too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, well, let's learn all about the E-2 Hawkeye and all its variants, and uh, let's go. Here we go. All right, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are talking the eyes of the fleet, the E-2 Hawkeye. We have Pilot and NFO joining us. First, you know our NFO already. Niles, how's it going? It's going well. Jello, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad we could pull this off. And joining us is E-2 Pilot Jonathan Ulbricht, call sign Gersh. How's it going, Gersh? Awesome, man. How are you doing, Jello? I'm doing well, thank you. So let's see, Niles and I are both here in San Diego, although not in the same room at the moment. Where are you? I'm in in the Atlantic, Florida on the kind of central east coast of Florida, just south of Cocoa Beach. Oh, that sounds nice. Are you avoiding all these storms? We're recording this in late August. Yeah, we had, we've been lucky so far. We had uh, one that kind of moved by us uh, a couple weeks ago, but it, it wasn't a big deal. Well, between the two of you, this will be a challenge because we don't have nonverbal communication like if we were all meeting in a studio. So we don't see each other. There could be some talking over or some long pauses. We'll do our best to clean it up in post-production. But uh, Jonathan, as our guest, we will direct questions to you. But obviously from up front in the E2, there are certain roles and things you do up there and the guys in the back are doing their different roles. So we'll see if we can paint the whole picture for the Hawkeye today. And of course, this is, as Niles, you and I spoke of, back on episode 31, a very important player in naval aviation. But before we do, Gersh, let's start with you. Where are you from? What did you do in the military? And what are you doing now? So I uh, kind of spent half my childhood as a Navy brat moving all over the country. Dad was a uh, ship driver. And then uh, after a second tour in Vietnam, we moved down south. And I spent the last half of my childhood in Birmingham, Alabama, and then went off to college at the Naval Academy. Graduated from there, went into the Navy, obviously, and ended up flying uh, E-2s for a while and um, ended up at the RAG as a, or the uh, replacement squadron as an instructor and, and um, was having kids and was headed back to sea as a department head. And so kind of had to make a decision on what I wanted to do and got a couple job offers and took one of them. Went to Pax River as a test pilot and I stayed there for about 18 years. And then from there, uh, took another job and I'm down in Florida now where I'm, I'm working at that other job. Okay, so during your 18 years at Pax River, were you involved with the E-2 there? Yeah, I was, predominantly doing air vehicle stuff. I, I uh, had never flown the C-2 in the fleet, but started doing a lot of C-2 work as well, doing air vehicle stuff, and 
other upgrades that they had, but I actually came in at a really good time because they were prepping for the um, eight-bladed propeller upgrade on the E2, the MP2000, and then rolled into the C2 as well, and then um, did a bunch of structural flight tests in preparation for the E2D. We had to take up the same air vehicle test bed that we had used for the propeller, and uh, they modified that with a, a lot of extra weight to make sure the uh, the main structure could handle the increased weight of the E2D. And then the E2D came around, and I did uh, a lot of the early flying with that and and then moved on. And Niles, you said on episode 31, when we had your background, that you had a little bit in the uh, foot in the water, if you will, with the E2D. Yeah, that's right. I was the operational test director for the E2D when it was uh, getting ready to enter into what we call IOT&E, the initial operational test and evaluation phase, which is the last big checkpoint before the Navy makes a decision whether or not they're going to go ahead and enter full rate production and buy something or whether there's still some bugs to be worked out first. And that was a pretty exciting time to be part of the program. So we were talking off tape before we hit record about whether the paths had ever crossed it. What did we decide? Did you guys cross paths somewhere along the way? Or maybe we did and we just don't know? I think we did. I don't think we flew together that often, but we might have had a flight or two together. But I definitely uh, remember him from around what we called the integrated test team there. All right. Excellent. All right, Gersh. Well, again, as our guest for this show, we're going to lean on you a little bit, but you can punt to Niles or Niles, you can fill in as well. But this being an aircraft series episode, we'll just start at the beginning like we always do. It's, what was this aircraft designed to do or maybe a little bit of design history on the E2 in general? Yeah. So I'll tell you what I know. One of the great things when I started at PAX, I, I got to work with some of the original guys that had been around for a long time. In fact, one of the consultant test pilots had been a retired chief pilot at Grumman and had done a lot of first flights. You go up to Bethpage and they have a display case with models and his name on it for first flights. So talk to him a little bit about, you know, some of the design philosophies on how they came up with the E2 in the early days. Yeah. Originally, I'm going to have to caveat this. I'm telling you what I remember. So this is inspired by true events, if not based on true events. (laughs) We'll say most of it's true, but don't hold me to it. But yeah, it was designed for, when I understand, for the Essex-class carrier originally. And so that drove a lot of the dimensions of the airframe, the uh, the length and the width and the height and everything. And and they actually, they had originally on the first variants, they had a dome that would retract and extend. They had fairings in the side that would kind of pop out, kind of classic Grumman design, really cool type of transformer (laughs) moving parts. And so Mm -hmm. you press a button on the, in the cockpit and that thing would actually lower down so they could get it inside the hangar bay of of an Essex class carrier. And and I don't think it actually ever, when they modified all those to angle decks, I don't think it ever operated off those, but it had been originally designed for that. So that drove a lot of the handling qualities issues that we're still dealing with the length of it coupled with the power that we have and uh, the directional control for it was an issue. So they They had to come up with a tail that would work with the radar as well. So they came up with short rudders and vertical tails. And and testing kind of revealed that three rudders gave enough control power to handle the single engine requirements. But the urban legend is when they rolled this thing out, it only had three rudders on it. And Admiral looked at it and said, well, that looks pretty hideous. There's no way we're putting that in the Navy. And so (laughs) they added... A fourth tail, which is the right inboard fin, is actually just a a structural member. It just sticks up. It's not a rudder. It doesn't move. So three of the four tails actually move, and that's why they do. You don't really need that fourth one. And so then that kind of, from that variant, the E2A led into the E2B, a lot of radar upgrades. The Navy kept seeing the value in it and what it could do with the, uh, the emerging, predominantly the Soviet threat at the time as the radar developed and the weapon systems in the back. And ultimately led to the E2C that kind of became the mainstay of what carrier AEW is today. And then that airplane evolved over the decades as well with new engines. It went from Allison 425s to 427 engines. So it went from 4,600 shaft horsepower roughly to about 5,100 shaft horsepower on the 427s. So that was more directional handling qualities, a lot more testing with that new engine mod. And kind of in parallel was the money getting pumped into the radar and the weapon system. And then as that program kind of continued to stretch out, there was some uncertainty as how the future of the airplane was going to 
play out. And, you know, there's like any large organization, the, the Navy, I think, struggled with some people seeing the value in it. And then some people, um, no offense, Jello, the single seat when you know those guys don't think they need it. But ultimately, we kind of squeaked by and got some science and technology research and development programs, proof of concept and seed money that kept coming in, kept the production line alive. And they finally got money for what was called the RMP, the Radar Modernization Program. And they developed the uh, proof of concept for what now is the radar and the E2D. And so that got approval by Big Navy. The money came. And when they started looking at it, the airframe at the time, the E2C, wasn't going to be able to support the weight and the structures with all the new systems and the weight of the radar. That's why they went ahead and funded the E2D program. That program, effectively, it's a on the outside, it looks like a legacy E2, E2C, but it's not at all. It's a completely different airplane on the inside, especially Niles can speak to this in the back. It's a completely different airplane. So that's kind of how we got ended up with the, the E2D. It's still a mixed bag, East and, and West Coast squadrons. Anyway, that's kind of where we are right now. No, that's all good stuff. Appreciate that. So the E2C and even the B, as I understand it, all were modified from early A's and B's. But like you said, the D is its own variant. So we'll touch on some of the variants in a moment. But Niles, just from the point of view of how this thing came to be in the first place, it's really to haul you and a couple friends around to go out there and do the things we talked about on episode 31, right? I mean, airborne early warning and what we would now call command and control and a whole bunch of other buzz terms. Yeah, that's right. And it is pretty amazing to see the progression of the aircraft uh, through the years. Uh, When I was an FRS student, I never flew Group Zeros operationally, but I had a couple of flights in the back of one in the rag there. And when you look at that thing and then compare it to where we've come with E2D, it absolutely is a night and day difference. It's pretty impressive to see how much you can do now with digital processing compared to a lot of the radar boxes back in the E2C days were all analog based. And once you've designed that with an analog system, you've pretty much locked it down. And that's the extent of what you're going to be able to do with it. But with digital processing, you come up with a better algorithm and you can and change the performance. So it opens up a lot of doors and it's pretty nice to see. But to your point, though, about being able to haul around the guys in the back, one of the biggest changes of the E2D is the fact that you're bringing in front-end integration now with the actual mission itself, because they can display a scope up there as well with a glass cockpit. So the displays are reconfigurable. And during the mission, they can bring up a scope and they can be more involved with the mission from up there too. So it, it's really leveraging all the manpower that you've got in that aircraft and all the brain power, more importantly, mm-hmm. to be able to give a better product. Well, that's a good point because Jonathan, when you guys are flying in the front, right, you've got takeoffs and landings, which are a challenge, especially at the carrier. Otherwise up at altitude, I would guess you guys are fairly underutilized. So what now one of you can manage the store, if you will, and the other can help the guys in the back. Wow. That kind of hurts jello. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> You struck first with a single seat thing there, mister. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Crossword puzzles are not easy to get. You know, when I was a group zero guy going back to group zeros and old school, we, we would go into a theater and we would take the ATO, the tasking for the day for all the different assets that we were working with. And it literally was a stack of printed paper and it would be ground assets. It'd be airborne assets, joint, foreign, whatever. And, and so we're flipping uh, as far as tasking orders real time real-time action, we would be up front as a co-pilot anyway, monitoring radios, solely radios, and we'd be flipping through these tasking uh, messages, trying to figure out who was supposed to go where or what we had, and then coordinate with the guys in the back. And likewise, the guys in the back with the Group Zero, I was always absolutely in awe of what they could do with that weapon system. Um, I mean, there's a lot of jokes about self-loading baggage. I, you shut up and get in the back, called them window lickers. I mean, it was, it was all in good fun. <laughs> of course. They're incredible guys. And the stuff that they, they were able to do with that system and they are able to do is, has always just amazed me. We had one story I wanted to, to share. We had a, uh, an E3 controller that did an exchange with us. And actually he did Fallon with us. So we went out and did the air wing workup as part of our cruise workups. And I think was when he checked into the squadron and he was with us for several months and then did some, he didn't cruise with us. I didn't make a full deployment, but he did some at sea periods with us. And I remember, you know, drinking beer with him in port and, and he truly could not believe 
what those guys in the back were allowed to do and what they were able to do. And I think that speaks, first of all, to the Navy, but it also speaks to the airplane and the community as well, that everybody kind of works together. They adapt. Those three guys are sitting right next to each other. I think that makes a huge difference as well in the AWACS. I've never been in AWACS, but talking to those guys, they've got to go through certain communication systems to get to a different controller. They may not know what's going on, depending on what the mission involves. And I don't know, I I just was always amazed with what was done with the capabilities of the airplane. And, And so now, as the airplane has kind of evolved and become this science fiction platform almost, it's unbelievable what they're doing with it. Yeah. Well, I think that it only seems logical not to minimize what you just said, minimize, I should say, but this aircraft was what designed around 1960 IOC to 1964. I think I read that it's the longest continuing run sea-based platform uh, for naval aviation of any type, fighter, attack, whatever. Naturally in 60 years, a lot of technology is going to change. And so if you think about what we had back then versus what we have now, frankly, I think it's kind of a miracle that the E2D looks anything like the predecessors. Yeah, right. Okay. So you threw out the term AWACS, and I just wanted to drop anchor on that for a moment. Is that a term the Navy generally embraces, or is that specifically an Air Force term? I think for those outside of our industry, they think of something with a big dome on top, a Frisbee, a dish, whatever you want to call it, like, oh, it's the Navy's AWACS. Is that something we embrace, or is that a totally different capability? I won't speak for Niles, but I'll say that I absolutely do not. It's not AWACS. I don't like ever being affiliated with. In fact, if we're going somewhere in voice, I'm going to probably get a lot of heat for saying that. But yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll go somewhere on a cross country and call a tower and the tower will be calling traffic or us to a, somebody else that's trying to land. And they'll say, yeah, you got a AWACS on short final or in left base or whatever. And, and I'll immediately pipe up and say, negative, we're a Navy E2. We're not an AWACS. So no, we're not. I don't know. <laughs> Niles, if yeah, I'll back you up on that. I mean, to a layperson, it's completely understandable. I mean, when you look at the acronym for what it stands for, it makes sense that it would be just referring to like a class of aircraft or like aircraft that do a particular function, mm-hmm. but it doesn't really mean that. I mean, it's a, uh, a specific term that refers to that particular platform. So it'd be a little bit like calling a Ford Explorer, um, you know, a, I don't know, an expedition or something. It's just a different thing. Yeah. So even though you guys do airborne warning and control, system effectively you don't refer to yourselves as AWACS. that's right okay jello I, if somebody says what's it like flying the AWACS?" i usually say AWACS doesn't have a tail hook and that's kind of the way <laughs> <I feel about laughs> it. that's right so we wouldn't know well on that note so what are some bread and butter missions i don't know if that's even an easy thing to answer but you guys are sometimes flying on quote unquote no fly days a lot like the helicopters on the ship I mean, you are, again, the eyes and maybe even the ears for the fleet. You're out there kind of taking things in, connecting different assets, uh, painting the picture for me and my fighter. By the way, your point is well taken. I certainly needed you guys, as Niles can attest, although Cinco, our F-35 guest, he started throwing out some assertions that he has as much SA as uh, you guys. So anyway, that's a different story. But let's talk missions. What are different kinds of things you can do? And maybe, Niles, this is a place for you, since probably a lot of the missions are based on the three of you back there. In terms of missions, though, I mean, what specifically uh, are you asking there? Yeah, so if an E-2 is deployed on a de- you know, deployment, mm-hmm. uh, what are some typical missions you- that aircraft might be called to do? One of the biggest things is, and you mentioned you know, flying on no-fly days and that kind of a thing, the strike group commander is very often going to have a strong interest in having us airborne because it extends the range that his strike group can see what's going on. And he's always going to feel more comfortable knowing that you've got that broader look than when you don't. It buys you some time and some decision space to have the thing airborne because if you need to launch fighters for something to intercept inbound aircraft, then and that's going to take a period of time. You know, if you're on an alert seven, uh, alert five, it's going to take you that amount of time, right, to get airborne. And generally, there's some decision process that goes into calling away the alert in the first place. So that is going to feed in as well. And all those things are built as part of the planning process when we decide, can you live with a section of fighters on alert 15? Or do you actually need somebody that's on a shorter alert than that? But having us airborne 
helps you get the information you need to be able to decide whether or not you're going to need to call away those fighters. So okay. that can help with a problem right there. But even when the rest of the air wing is flying, it's generally assumed that we're going to be airborne at any given time because we help with that communications across the air wing as everybody is airborne, being able to just manage the picture from airborne. It might seem, especially to a layperson, like, well, why can't you do that from the ground? But we mentioned having the proximity of the three guys in the back that are right there within arm's reach of each other. It's amazing how much of a difference that makes in being able to coordinate things in real time and have one person that's focused on one piece of the picture, another person that's focused on another part, and they can just reach across and say, hey, you've got this guy coming over here. He's going to need to check in with you and become a double SC asset to do surface search and coordination, for example. So being able to have everybody sitting there close by, but have all the radios and the resources and the sensors systems that they need to be able to turn things around quickly. A lot of times on a ship, things just get more spread out and it's harder to do that from the shipboard yeah. environment. Yeah. So you guys, when you get up there, you really have the capability to do any number of different tasks or roles, if you will. There's air interdiction, like you just said, there's surface surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if I'm up there playing with you, we've got offensive, defensive, counter air. And so really even what, search and rescue you guys can coordinate? Or even uh, isn't there an element of counter narcotics, which isn't, I guess, really necessarily anything different other than the people you're looking at are just maybe have a different nefarious uh, motives than, than right. other people you're looking at. But what it comes down to is you guys are up there and you're the eyes and able to see around and give that information to others. Yeah. And a lot of what we're doing is not dramatically different from one mission set to the other. It's what you're trying to do with the assets under your control that winds up being different. I mean, because at the end of the day, the radar is just what the radar is. The radar doesn't know whether it's on an air mission or a double SC mission or whether it's supporting a strike over land. The radar just knows that it is detecting contacts and showing you where they are. It's how you interpret the information and how you prioritize the information because when you're in, for example, a strike group air defense mission, you may have a different set of priorities than if you were controlling an overland strike. So the other piece of what we're doing a lot of times in the air, though, is also coordinating with other assets and sources of information, whether that be ESM, which is detecting other electronic signals that are out there in the air, and using that to kind of inform the picture and help us decide what different things might be. In that example of an overland strike, there might be an unlocated mobile SAM site out there. If we start picking up radar indications of where that is, and we can triangulate its position, then we can relay that to the strikers and have them lean out of the way, and that can help keep them safe. So it's that matter of uh, trying to fuse all these different information sources together and prioritize in real time and then get the most important information to the people that need it at the time that winds up differentiating how we do things for different mission sets. Which, getting back to Gersh and his point about Fallon, is why the whole team goes up there. Because we've got the E2 crew in the brief and all the fighters and strikers and seed guys and everybody else. And you go out and fly the mission and you come back and you debrief it ad nauseum and everybody gets a chance to critique themselves and each other and see what we we could have said and did say and et cetera, et cetera. If I could, I'd like to just add one other thing too, that sure. something that isn't often done, but it has been done historically when there's a disaster, like in Japan with a nuclear power plant or, or Katrina, you know, that airborne command and control is actually utilized for those types of, you know, major disasters. They'll, an E2 will be airborne helping with the civilian people and personnel and yeah. everybody else is trying to respond to something like that. As we are supporting things in the Navy where we may be doing humanitarian relief operations like what you just mentioned, it could be that, it could be something like off the coast of Haiti or whatever, when there is some sort of natural disaster and we're trying to take advantage of the Navy's ability to do things like move around supplies with helicopters and CODs and bringing those into the affected area, uh, it can be very helpful to have somebody airborne that can keep an eye on who is going where and making sure that the most updated information, uh, like back in the Katrina days when people were sending up on rooftops trying to get picked up by rescue helicopters. You know, if you get a call that there's somebody else at a new location, then figure out which helicopter is closest to that and then direct them over there to that to, to help do the most right. good. When I was at Third Fleet, I believe we called that DISCA, Defense Support to Civilian Authorities, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I mean, when it comes right down to it, we've got a capability that can be useful in different situations. And if we're available, we're going to use it. Right. I don't know why it's on my mind, but Gersh, at the boat, Niles, obviously you're aware of this too, but just from the point of view of cyclic operations, obviously if you guys needed the 
qualifications or something like that, you might fly more. But because of the legs of the aircraft, you know, you don't really need to always turn around. A lot of times you guys wouldn't go up and down on every cycle like the fighters, right? You might go up and skip a cycle and come back down later. Triple cycles kind of stretching it. I didn't do any Afghanistan stuff, but I heard the guys would do triple cycles uh, depending on the length of the cycles of the boat or on the deck. And so they would drive both the night currency and any kind of, hopefully not day currency, but we would do sometimes we call them trap cat traps. So exactly what you're maybe alluding to where we land and then we'd take a catapult, do a seat swap. And then the other pilot would switch over to the the left seat and get a trap as well. Just Mm -hmm. trying to maintain our currency. Okay. Yeah. As a squadron opto, that was always one of the tricky things to balance because you're getting a more efficient mission profile by keeping the plane airborne for longer because, you know, during that time that you're climbing to station or, you know, you're going through the approach checklist and coming back to the ship, that's time that you're not able to do your primary mission. So you can minimize that amount of time and minimize the amount of the percentage of the flight that is being spent in Marshall that way and get more bang for your buck. But at the same time, you've also got to balance that need to keep all your pilots current and give them as many looks behind the boat as you can. And so then that gets into, you know, you may occasionally do a couple of single cycles at night just to get another look at the boat or Mm -hmm. you can uh, do the trap cat trap. But that kind of rubs the flight deck the wrong way, though, because they hate keeping the uh, catapults open that long after the rest of the launch is already finished up. So, yeah. Well, not just that, but having you guys or the CODs turning on deck is always a kind of a manpower requirement and a safety requirement because those big old props, boy, they don't care what gets in the way. That's not going to go well if someone walks Mm -hmm. into that. So I think we talked about this on the C2 episode, but anytime you guys are turning on deck, you're going to have folks around you in the daytime shaking their wrists at night, shaking some lights, just try to don't walk between us because if you get in that prop arc, bad things are going to happen. Yeah. And then also, is that part of the reason, Niles, what you were just saying but also what i was talking about like let's get that thing out of here don't they typically shoot you guys five or ten minutes early they do and it's a combination of those factors i mean part of it is uh yeah get us off the deck sooner to make it easier to taxi everyone else around and not have to maintain the safety chain there but a lot of it also is getting us airborne a few minutes early so that we can start building the picture you know we can climb to station and then when the fighters launch then we're in a position where we're ready to actually you know catch them and do something with the information rather than uh fumbling around trying to set our own radar up at the time. All right. So, Gersh, uh, you kind of went through the variants earlier, and we don't need to belabor it too much more. I did read that about 60 or so A variants were made, and a lot of those were converted to the Bs. I wonder, did you ever have a chance to fly those? I mean, my recollection from both as a young man going to air shows, even at Point Magoo, where you used to be based, Niles, but when I think of E2, I always want to throw the letter C on there. I guess those early variants weren't too prolific, or were they just before my time, maybe? I think probably a little of both. I never did. No, I, I never flew this. Okay. Yeah, the E2C was uh, IOC'd, I think, in 1973. So it's been in the fleet for a long time. But we kind of got away from actually calling it a new series. You know, we just did these incremental upgrades. The original 1973 E2C is nothing like the Hawkeye 2000 that's still technically an E2C. Uh, but we, we kept that designation for the series for a long time. Okay. Is that, do you think, because maybe the nomenclature is more about the airframe and by then they'd figured out some of the cooling and other things. I think they extended the fuselage, if I remember correctly, on the sea. But you had, like you guys alluded to earlier, Group Zero, Group One, Group Two, and then Mm -hmm. all these different upgrades. Was that mostly avionics for the guys in the tube? Mostly. You had an engine upgrade that came Mm -hmm. along uh, in there when we went from the 425 to the 427 engines, like you mentioned earlier. And that was with the uh, Group Two Hawkeye. And we had some uh, front-end cockpit upgrades that happened over the years, too. Uh, Navigation system improvements and that kind of thing. But a lot of it was focused on back-end system upgrades. But part of it is just jumping through all the acquisition hoops. It's a lot easier to get you know, a lot of small Mm -hmm. improvements through the acquisition system than it is to get one big mammoth improvement through the acquisition system. So it can improve your chances of success to take some small bites there instead of uh, trying to do one big bite all at once. Gotcha. And then proliferation wise, I don't think we're the only ones that fly this. Looks like I read Egypt, France, uh, who else flies this? So you got Japan. I'm going to have to go to the notes. <laughs> Taiwan flies them. We've had some interesting ones. Mexico, believe it or not, I think had them for a while. And Singapore did as well, and Israel. Actually, Israel used them pretty successfully in the war with Syria. They 
They have long since moved on from those. I think Singapore is fine. The Gulfstream 550, as is Israel now with a spar on the uh, roof. All right. Now, normally the next question on my list here for the aircraft series is armament. And I think we can probably keep this one pretty short because, correct me if I'm wrong, Gers, there's pretty much nothing with a pickle button for you up there, huh? You know, it depends on how you look at it. I would say that it's the exact opposite. We got a ton of weapons and a lot of pickle buttons, and they're all the fighters and everybody else that they got. Ah, touche. Okay. But as far as for you guys, you're obviously not launching anything, although there is some talk about, and I don't know what we can and can't cover, but at some point I thought I read that someone else could launch something that you guys could help guide. But I guess what I'm getting at is for your own protection, you're basically hoping for distance and time and someone else to get in the way, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, there was an experiment once where they tried to put an AIM-9 on an E-2. And I'm serious, they actually did this and did a test flight, but uh, it didn't go very well. The exhaust from the missile flamed out the engine. So I guess they went back <laughs> to the drawing board on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're needing to shoot that, then things are definitely wrong. But actually, Gersh, to your point, and it's well taken, thank you. The real weapon on this thing is that big 24-foot dome on top. Uh, like I said, Frisbee, I don't know what to call it. I guess just radar. But what can or can't we talk about that thing? I guess one thing I wonder is... Why does it need to rotate? And maybe this is just my own ignorance with radars, but is it just a part of it that actually transmits something and the rest is there for balance? Because if the whole thing is transmitting, then why bother rotating it? And so, Niles, I'm probably looking at you here. Well, it does rotate. It is a, it's a mechanically scanned antenna. So if you took away the dome, the dome is just a big fairing. What is on the inside of it, uh, at least on the E2C version, it looks almost like a, a rooftop TV antenna. You know how it's got that kind of like a, you know, one big cross piece with a bunch of uh, perpendicular bars coming off of it. Um, so that's what it looks like on the inside. And so by mechanically rotating the thing, it's hydraulically powered. And and as that thing moves through the air, you're changing where that, that sweet spot of the antenna is. And so it's, you know, if you do some kind of a, like a electrical engineering visualization, you'd see like a big lobe out in front as it sweeps through the air. Um, now the E2D though, it's a little bit different. Uh, the D E2D is a combination of mechanically scanned and electrically scanned. So now, uh, since since the original E2C came out, you know, there's things like, say, the Aegis ships, for example, where you notice they don't have a big rotating, you know, traditional radar dish like the thing on the top of the Millennium Falcon. They don't have that. Um, what they have instead is um, they've got these things that are hexagonal shaped, I think. I don't think they're oct octagons. I think they're hexagons. But anyway, around the, um, the bridge of the, uh, of the Aegis ship, and that thing is a whole bunch of tiny little antenna elements. And by, you know, firing them off one at a time, with the constructive and destructive interference, they can shape that lobe of radar energy that is coming out of the thing. So we can kind of do the same technique with the E2D's dome now, but uh, it's rotating, but then there's also some ability to maneuver the beam uh, as it is sweeping around. And you can do some interesting tricks with it, but that's about as far as we can go with that. Sure. But does that provide for some updated, uh, well, update rates, I guess? Uh, I keep using the same word twice in my sentences, but you get the point. In other words, sometimes when you are supporting me and your E2C uh, and I'm um, in my F18C, sometimes you need a sweep or two, right, to know if a group is in fact maneuvering. Um, but, uh, you know, and that takes, I forget how many seconds, five or seven, something, but... Um, yeah, six seconds. Six, okay, yeah, there you go. But uh, is, is it a little better than in the E2D with update rates? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, I, I misspoke there. Six RPM, so it's actually 10 seconds for the update there. All right, fair enough. We always try to stay out of trouble in this thing. And then, so if this thing is always rotating, is it always rotating or just like, does it stop for takeoffs and landings? I guess my point is, Gersh, is there anything about the dome that affects you? Like if it's supposed to rotate and it doesn't, does that affect the way it flies? No, that's a good question. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Have they ever had one of these things fly off or fall off or... So only mishaps, uh, but I will tell you this kind of jumping ahead a little bit, I guess, a, a funny seat. I hope this is funny. <laughs> a friend of mine, we used to actually fly uh, these airplanes uh, either to drop off a dome for repair or pick up a dome uh, cross country without a dome. And so the flight friend of mine, a couple, obviously a plane full of guys going to California for a good deal. And they used the call sign as they were flying cross country without the dome is topless. 
And so when, when they got to work Monday morning, the skipper called them in their office because I, I guess there was a controller that it, it was none too impressed with the, the call sign that he was going across country. So that, that's kind of the only domeless story I, that I have for you. All right. Even E2 crews can get in trouble. I thought it was just the fighter guys. All right. Good to know. Gersh, sticking with you, performance-wise, I read that it goes up to mid-30s, about 340 knots or so. What have you seen in this thing? I mean, obviously, you're not yanking and banking, but what can it do and what have you seen? I'll just go ahead and, and say yes to that. <laughs> okay. It's not obviously a tactical aircraft in the regard that we don't really uh, we don't really go left to left with a Hornet and, and try to turn on you. So it's all about gas. There are some in-flight refueling variants that are coming out. The AR capability has been put on to some airplanes, and that's actually starting to get integrated into the fleet. They're retrofitting planes, and some are coming off the production line as well now with it. So uh, that ability will be there. I don't know how happy the crews are going to be having to be strapped into the airplane for eight hours on station, but <laughs> they, uh, yeah, it's all about saving gas. And especially if you're working a triple cycle and you don't know what the weather's like back at the boat, we typically don't put the throttles up and try to get somewhere quick. Well, if you come into the break though, and you want to try to, well, I won't say showboat because it has a negative connotation, but of course you also have to be able to slow down, but what's a typical overhead speed for the E2? I mean, I'm obviously old school. We would go over 300. I don't know what the current air wing limits are, the different wing limits. But, you know, they're trying to make these airplanes last. Of course. But yeah, you're right. The lieutenants will come in at the, and break at the round down. Going, at, we used to go as fast as we possibly could. But mm-hmm. but you cannot look cool in an E2. You just can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's entirely not true. I don't know why you're saying such crazy talk. Well, so on one flight coming back, it was a cross country from Fallon back to the East Coast. And it was the time of year that we had a really kicking uh, jet stream coming in from behind. And we're all sitting there watching the CDU, the control display unit there that was showing the ground speed indicator because we saw it inching up. And like when we finally hit 500, it, that was a, a moment of glory <laughs> for all of us to actually see five bills on the CDU. You. Oh, dear. Well, speaking of the aerial refueling, a uh, couple thoughts on that. First off, Gersh, how are pilots finding that as far as how easy is it to do? I mean, in the F-18, it wasn't that hard, uh, especially the more experienced I got. But what's been the feedback so far from people that are trying to do it in the E-2? So that's a great question. I'll tell you my experience. I did some of the initial proof of concept plugs. So we just literally had a uh, a steel pole effectively kind of mod. Actually, the Israelis did this. They would plug behind C 130s with their airplanes. Oh. So, same kind of design kind of comes out in between the uh, co pilot and the pilot, sticks straight out. It doesn't retract, it's a fixed probe. The plane that I flew, all I did was uh, dry plugs behind a C 130. I will say also that the flight controls that I flew were unmodified at the time, they were kind of the legacy E 2C flight controls. And I was absolutely hideous at first trying to plug this thing. (laughs) I had a really steep learning curve. I did get better, but it was different than anything I'd ever done before. It was a real challenge. I I was just so surprised, I think, to see how close the basket actually comes to the windscreen when we're doing it. But as time's gone on, they've actually uh, modified the flight controls to make it easier. And they've done some stuff to the handling qualities. And the lead guys on that up at Pax River, from what I understand, they've gotten it down pretty well. And they've, I think, had good success with training the guys in the fleet. And it's a testament to both the test pilots. They kind of took that program from the beginning to the end and and then all the training that they've given the fleet guys. And, you know, E2 guys is, in general, the airplane's so difficult to fly that I think they pick stuff up pretty quickly. And I, again, I think it's a testament to the community and the pilots that are out there doing it. No doubt. Well, my very first flight in the Navy was as a midshipman. It was on the Midway, which is now a museum. And I think it was VAW-113. Are they the ones with the black silhouette, like of a bird's head or something? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, black eagles. Okay. So I rode with them as a midshipman in the tube. And then much later, as a CAG Ops uh, in around 2009 or 10, I got to ride up in the front seat with you guys. And so the point of refueling that you alluded to Gersh I want to touch on is I don't necessarily remember like some of the other aircraft we've had on this show they talk about having little galleys and at least porta potty type things but I don't remember too many crew comforts for you guys but do you bring along like a an igloo or these days a yeti cooler or is it just uh piddle packs or for the folks who will have to do these super long flights now what kind of crew comforts are there 
Not much. They're <laughs> relief tubes. The big upgrade with that is in the, the D, they actually put a relief tube by the main entrance hatch, the door that we go in and out of, so you can stand up when you're using it. I mean, there's just not a whole lot of crew comfort. They have modified, and they're still continuing to modify the seats. They're looking at other things to try to help the fatigue of the crew, I think. But the big thing is going to be like anything else. When you give an airframe or a community um, a capability, it's how that's managed by the type commander and the skippers and then the wing commanders and stuff. Okay. So unrefueled, what's your, for each of you, what's your longest flight? I've squeaked out over five hours. Definitely land-based, you can do over five hours. Sure. At the boat, I don't think I ever did really much over four and a half. Okay. Yeah, I'd say about the same thing. I couldn't think off the top of my head, you know, which one is is the highest, but it would be five point something. Okay. And I guess we didn't really talk about it anywhere else, but pilot and co-pilot in the front and Gersh is the left seater, maybe not always what the senior guy, but is that the one who is going to do at least at the carrier, the catapults and, and, uh, landings? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The guy in the left seat or person left, okay. seat, they'll be doing that. Niles, I think back on episode 31, we talked about the folks in the back. I think what it's the Seco in the middle and then the RO and help me out here. And the, uh, ACO. So they call the section in the back, the combat information center. And so that's why the mission commander there is the Seco. He's the combat information center officer. Then you've got the air control officer, the ACO that is sitting to his left. Then the, uh, RO, the radar officer who is uh, sitting to his or her right. And these folks are, if you imagine a top-down view of the airplane, whereas passengers on an airline are all facing forward, they are pointing to the left. So the yeah. ACO is farthest back or aft, and the RO is farthest forward. That's right, yeah. So when we're taking off and landing, the seats will uh, rotate 90 degrees. So you face forward for takeoff and landing, which is mm-hmm. pretty important like on the ship, uh, especially when you got a you know fair amount of G-forces of acceleration and deceleration on the cats and traps. But then once you get airborne, then uh, you pivot your seat around and face the scopes, and that becomes your focus. Yeah, I do remember that very first catapult as a midshipman in the back of that E-2, and I thought my world was upside down because my inner ear had never experienced anything quite like that. So It's a weird sensation, too, because... You know, your primary visual cues are not outside, you know, when you're in the back of the tube. So at least when you're in the cockpit of an E2 or in the cockpit of a fighter, you can kind of balance what's going on versus what you're seeing and what you're feeling match up a little bit more closely. It's probably a better way to put that. But in the back of the E2, there is a small window to the side, but it's almost in your peripheral vision. You know, most of your visual cues are all still static. You know, they're right there in front of you. So except for the things like the hoses, the oxygen masks and stuff that all of a sudden, you know, rocket backwards as if you like tip the plane up on its tail, you don't really have a visual indication that you're moving, but you certainly feel it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I do remember that small window. And to me, it looked like the horizon, the, what little I could see was vertical. But again, that was my inner ear. Mm-hmm. How do you guys, to Gersh's earlier point, how do you decide whose turn it is to lick the window? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got three windows. So yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, this is the point in the list here where it's always hard because this aircraft isn't designed to do everything, but strengths and weaknesses. And Gersh, we'll start with you. I mean, let's put it this way. What was your favorite feature or is your favorite feature about the E2? My favorite feature about the E2? um, I think it's the other crew members. I think... When you're out doing a mission, especially with the Group Zeros, I had a lot of in-flight emergencies with this airplane just from mechanical failures, a couple pretty serious ones. You know, I had a friend of mine that jumped out of an E-2 a long time ago. Actually, it was a five-person bailout, and everybody survived. I've never had to do anything like that, but I think it's just like anything else when you work with people and you cruise with them and you go into combat with them and you go on the beach with them. I think it's the guys that you work with and the ability to kind of do the job and coalesces as a group of people when there's a problem in in the airplane, either with a mission or with the airplane. I think that was my favorite part about the E2 was the guys that I flew with. Yeah, that's a good answer. How about you, Niles? You know, it's funny. uh, This was not a pre-coordinated answer, but I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. I was going to say that I think one of the biggest strengths of the E2 is the fact that you do have that Goldilocks-sized crew. You know, it's big enough that you can get a little bit more brain power on things than if you 
had only a couple of people there, but at the same time, it's not so big that it starts to become unwieldy. So it's like just the right size and you can just really work together as a team and get a lot done. Mm -hmm. And you got more people to hang out with when you go in cross countries. (laughs) That's true. I was always my own best friend when I went on mine. Uh, Okay. What about uh, Gersh? Was there ever one thing that you just wish, darn it, why don't they fix this? And of course you'd have to look at yourself with 18 years at the uh, (laughs) Pax River, but was there ever one thing about it that just you wish they would have put a little more money or technology or something into? Yeah, I got to be careful how I answer that. I, so <laughs> the one thing I will say is how it flies. You know, it watched some hideous passes at the boat with the Tomcat. And if guys would, as you know, especially with the older jets, when they get sucked back on the power and crossing the ramp is whisper jets, but it wasn't as dangerous to fly or bring aboard the boat or as the Tomcat was, or like an A7 or something like that. I think it was the most difficult and still is the most difficult airplane to bring aboard the boat. It's a real handful of an airplane. Every single thing you touch with the power or the controls, you got to change. We, it looks like you're riding a stationary bike and an elliptical machine all at the same time sometimes when you're coming back aboard the boat. So I think the handling quality. So, yeah. And they are working on that. Well, I would say that my experience in the front seat as a CAG ops would definitely attest to that because I was able to watch the pilot and the ball and everything else. And it was amazing to see, frankly, just how much inputs are required, how many inputs. And uh, it's a very busy time for you guys. But on the other hand, I think, are you coming aboard, what, in the 120s-ish? Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. So we, we definitely have uh, a more more extended look at the ball, than, which is good and bad sometimes because right. oh, yeah. all our flaws are exposed the longer we're behind the boat. But yeah, that's right. We're about 120 share a quick story too. I had one of my best friends in my fleet squadron and he was one of the LSOs. And so he would take all the Hornet guys with him when we were doing landing practices, FCLPs, carry landing practices at the field. And he would slit a rainbow curly wig, like the John 316 wig, and he would put it over his helmet and he put a clown nose that squeaked on his nose. And so the Hornet guys would start flying their first few passes and he they were just all over the place, almost running into the LSO shack. They'd get airborne again, and he'd look over at him and squeak his nose and say, yeah, it's a lot harder than he thought it was. So <laughs> a different kind of airplane to bring aboard the boat. Well, you have, of course, the propellers are rotating the same direction. So every time you add a little power or take off a little power, you've got all kinds of different secondary effects. So plus you have a huge wing and lineup is critical and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, uh, full props to you guys, but uh, no pun intended there. But a lot of times the real good E2 pilots were consistently top 10 for the grades. Yeah, that's exactly right. Some of them definitely were. Mm -hmm. All right. How about you, Niles? Was there one thing in the back you wish they would just fix? I think they've made a lot of progress with the E2D. So some of the things that I would have said about the E2C, uh, I feel like we're on the right track. The one thing, though, that, you know, if you just had a magic wand and you could just change things all around is it'd be nice if we could get to an airframe that wasn't as vibration prone as the E2 is because, Mm -hmm. you know, those props put a significant amount of vibration over the plane and, you know, that wears out the crew. It sounds weird, but if you've been in that kind of a, you know, an environment where it's just like constantly shaking, you know, for five hours at a time, it's different than just sitting at a desk for five hours. It definitely wears you out and it wears out the equipment too. I mean, we have so many issues and, you know, it causes, you know, readiness problems because parts fail faster because they're constantly subject to that vibration and it breaks connections on the electronics and stuff like that. So that's definitely a weak spot. And if we could, you know, somehow wave a wand and turn the thing into some nice turbofan engines on there instead of the big props, that would be nice. But, uh, you know, I know it's not that simple. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, wasn't the change from the four bladed to the eight bladed propeller system supposed to fix that or at least help? It helped. And I've been in both, but I haven't been in them side by side. I had a, you know, a break of time between I left flying four blades and then, you know, had a couple of years doing something else. And then I came back and I was in the eight blade. You know, it's different, but it doesn't completely fix the problem. I mean, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. How about notoriety? Where would the listener have seen the E2 Hawkeye, whether in the news, performances? I mean, it makes appearances at air shows, I guess, once in a while, but like at a carrier on a friends and family day cruise, it'll generally come do a super, you know, fast flyby fast for you guys. But I'm guessing there's no demonstration teams of E2s flying around in formation. How about Hollywood? 
How about you, Gersh? Uh, I think we talked about in the C2 episode that they showed Jack Ryan going aboard. I forget which movie, but all of a sudden it was an E2. But uh, where else is this thing showing itself? So in the other one, this is a really old kind of a throwback film, uh, late 70s, but it's a classic naval aviation oh, sure. final countdown about going back to Pearl Harbor. They, it's kind of all Grumman uh, stock footage with Tomcats and E2s, but they had a lot of E2 footage in that. And, you know, I'm going to the, to the air shows. I don't want to, because I'm going to get, you know, more people mad at me, but I, I won't do any of my worst hillbilly accents. But when you go to the air shows, the comments you get about what, and you even kind of did it a little bit jelly talking about whatever that thing is on the roof, the Frisbee <laughs> or the dish. I mean, people are just absolutely, is that a hurricane chaser? <laughs> and so, cause you got to stand there as a static display when the plane's on display and so, you know, you come up with, no, it's an in-flight helicopter refueling pad or it's a, an escape <laughs> pod or, you know, uh, anyway. So the notoriety, I guess, from the air shows or, or something else that kind of, it definitely sticks out, I guess, is where it was. Oh, yeah. No, it's very distinct. So I seem to remember in the movie Miami Vice, I want to say that, uh, you know, the drug kingpin character wanted to know where the E2 was going to be because it was going to you know break up a shipment of a product there. <laughs> there was a similar line in Scarface, too, I think, where he wanted to know. I think he called it the AWAX, though. He called it the, I want to know where the E2 AWAX is or something like that. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys put a hurt, and I hope, on uh, their narcotics trade, so that's a good thing, plus doing good work everywhere else. All right, well, we're just about done. Uh, let's see, we've had a couple good sea stories. Anything else, Jonathan? How about uh, any memorable flights for you or any other experiences? So, I, yeah, I've had the uh, in-flight emergencies, like I like kind of alluded to. This is going to be kind of a funny, I don't know, off-topic. It was actually a C2 story. I took. I was going on the road. We actually went to Nantucket. We landed, and it was an eight-bladed C-2, and the C-2 is, you know, kind of a beefy-looking airplane anyway, and it's got a, uh, especially with the eight-bladed propellers, it's, I guess, I don't know that I would ever use the word imposing, but I'm standing there waiting for the gas truck to show up, and 19-year-old kid that was working the transient line came over to me, and he said, hey, is that a C-2? Is that a cod? And I said, yeah. He goes, man, that thing is badass. And I just remember <laughs> looking at him and cracking up. And I said, I have never heard somebody call a cod badass before, but I appreciate it. So <laughs> that was, I don't know, but kind of a different twist on a memorable story. But that was, that well, that's was good. Funny. I mean, this young guy probably worked there because he was enthusiastic about airplanes. So hopefully he went out and found his way into a cockpit somewhere. All right. How about you, Niles? Any good sea stories from your E2 days? Well, there was an incident back in 2004. And I actually did a podcast uh, with my uh, UCLA uh, uh, MBA class just recently about this incident because it came up on one of our chat groups. But there was a certain UFO sighting off the Nimitz that year and uh, uh, that made the yes. news. And somebody talked about the news article periodically. You know, it pops up in the news again, you know, something about the Pentagon releasing UFO footage or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, I was on that flight. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a good icebreaker. Yeah. Well, all right. So just to uh, cut to the end, did you guys see anything on your scopes? Uh, yeah, we did, actually. Um, if it hadn't have been for anybody else involved, I probably would have just chalked it up to some weird radar clutter or something. But uh, the ship was seeing it, too, and they asked us to vector the fighters over that were doing an air defense exercise with us. When they went over there to VID it, you know, I was kind of thinking it was going to come up to be nothing. It didn't have the kind of motion that you would expect an aircraft to have on the radar display. Mm -hmm. When they got over there and they started talking about something shaped like a Tic Tac and, and it's turning with me and stuff like that, I'm like, I'm not really sure what's going on right now. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it took the SA out of your um, head there. We did have a, an episode on that subject with Commander Fravor, as yeah. you recall. I was also on the boat that day. I don't remember if I was flying or not, but yeah, that has become quite the <laughs> boogaloo or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's funny because I was flying the other day in my airline capacity with a captain who uh, I'd flown with him before and I introduced the show to him and he listened to that episode and he came back the next time we flew together and he goes, Jello, that completely changed my mind on UFOs. He says, I used to think everybody who believed in that was just like Russell from Independence Day, but he goes, I really don't know what to think. <laughs> and I said, I don't either, Tom. And I was right there talking to Commander Fravor and on the ship that day. And, and now you're adding to it too. Yeah. So excellent. All right. Well, Niles, you probably just put yourself on the radar of a bunch of conspiracy theorists and UFO fans out there. So stand by for phone calls.
Oh, boy. Yes, definitely. I intentionally withheld my UFO <laughs> yeah. story, just as a side note. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, well, we'll stop tape here in a second and get that from you. Oh, whoops. I didn't stop tape. Anyway. Cool. All right. Well, hey guys, this has been a lot of fun. You know, it's always interesting to me that the aircraft that you think might be sort of boring and it's so true for all of them anyway, but it's really about the people. I mean, this is a vital mission I, and I'm not going to defend. You know, I think the F-18 is better or anything else. Gersh, I appreciate the jabs there, but I mean, it really does take the whole team and we would be blind without you guys out there. So the E-2 is one of those I think unsung heroes, but it definitely deserves all the accolades it can muster. Well, thanks. <laughs> I don't get the feeling you believe me there, Niles, but uh... <laughs> I agree with you 100% that it really is all about the people. I know that sounds cliche, but it's telling, I think, that both of us, when you asked us what we thought the uh, strength of the aircraft was, we both independently thought of the same thing and that that was yeah. working together as a crew it really makes a lot of difference i don't know if i could have stuck with the e2 for 20 years if i was in the plane by myself <laughs> you kind of got to have some social well, companionship there <laughs> yeah you would have been really busy too so gersh just from where you used to work and uh, i don't know if you stay in certain circles or whatever but the future for this aircraft i mean will they start over at some point or could there be an e2 e model I don't think there's any end in sight for it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I think big Navy and DOD see a lot of potential and need for it. I don't see any end. Okay. I think it's going to be around in some form or fashion for a long time. Well, and that was also a cleverly disguised transition to the end couple questions, which is what does the future hold for you? So you're comfortable down there in Florida is just more of the same. Yeah. Uh, trying to make a fool out of myself on a surfboard. I want to give a, a shout out to uh, my son. The future is looking pretty bright for him. He's the one who actually got me. I contacted you guys to be part of the podcast. I really appreciate that. Anyway, Liam, he uh, is going to be an F-35 guy with the red tails in the uh, Alabama Air National Guard. So he's waiting to start his Air Force training. So that's a, a big part of our family's future. That's awesome. And as I understand, Liam is there with you as we're recording. So Liam, if you can hear this, congratulations going from street to lightning two. That's pretty epic. And we definitely like to keep in touch with him to find out how all that process goes, because we have a lot of young people out there listening to this show that would be like to be just like him. Thank you, Jill. I'd love to keep in touch with you all as well. Awesome. All right. And then final question, Gersh, Jonathan Ulbricht. How did someone come up with Gersh? Is this an acronym perhaps? No, it's not. It's a really a nickname. I, I was in a physics class at the academy, and my roommate was sitting next to me, who ended up being a, a Tomcat skipper and then a CAG. And he was sitting there, and the, we had a professor that was a substitute professor. It was a, an odd snow day that they, a lot of the professors weren't able to come in. And so the uniforms that we would wear in the wintertime, you have long sleeve shirts and you wear ties and a name tag that's we used to anyway. It was sewed over your pocket. And block lettering. It said J.G. Ulbrich, my last name. And so his professor was trying to keep everybody awake. We want to be outside throwing snowballs at each other, I guess. And so was giving an example about something. And he said, well, what do you think about that, Mr. Gershmit? And everybody kind of looked around at each other. And, and uh, my roommate looked at me because he realized this guy was talking to me and he future Tomcat guy. And he laughed. He goes, Gershmit. And he, so it just stuck. Gersh is short for Gershmit. It is more of a nickname than anything that I did. I've done plenty of stupid stuff in my life, but that's kind of what has stuck. No, we all have. That's for sure. So the fact that you got away with all the other stuff is <laughs> definitely a testament to either your sneakiness or whatever. But what did you study at the Academy? Um, it was kind of a mishmash of basic core engineering courses and computer science. Okay. Because I get the question often on the show and on the side from emails and elsewhere that pilots uh, like Liam there wonder if they need to necessarily major in super technical fields. And I try to tell them no, although you have that. And then uh, Niles, if I remember correctly, I think you were aerospace engineer or design or something. Yeah, I was uh, aerospace engineering for my undergrad. And uh, I also, I was commanding officer of a recruiting district out in the Midwest covered uh, Kansas, Missouri, and yep. uh, Southern Illinois. And I got a lot of uh, experience there in terms of what the Navy is looking for, it, both for OCS uh, applications, for so people who have their college behind them already or are about to finish it up, and they're trying to, to go straight into uh, the Navy and, and aviation, or also for people who are looking for ROTC scholarships. And mm. I will say that the Navy 
has a strong preference for technical degrees when it comes to ROTC scholarships, because the reality is, as great as we all think aviation is, the nuke power world is a big driver for where the scholarships yeah. get funded. And that means that the Navy does like to see a lot of people who, they may not become uh, nuclear engineers later in the Navy, but they like to at least pick people that there's a chance that they might be, you know, whereas if you're a history major, you're probably not going to be a nuke. Uh, (laughs) So they like to keep the door open that way. But if you manage to get that ROTC scholarship and then, you know, you later find yourself not caring as much about mechanical engineering and wanting to go into be a history major or something like that, uh, it's not going to close the door to you to become a pilot. Gotcha. Gersh, did you find though that that background as an undergrad helped you with the TPS stuff that you did later? It has. I majored really in graduation. I I was not a great student (laughs) in college. Okay. Yeah. And I was always surprised at how much I think I learned and didn't realize I was learning as I kind of went out and, and started doing the work that I ended up doing. You know, I will say too, though, that a lot of the guys I flew with in the fleet and actually in the test community as well, a lot of their undergrads were for the ones that went on and get to say technical master's they were liberal arts degrees or in the humanities. I mean, some of the best pilots I've known, single seat guys, they were music majors from different schools in the country. I think that artistic background really makes for a strong aviator as well. So I yeah. absolutely agree with what Niles is saying. I don't, I don't have the experience of the professional background that he does, but just because somebody isn't in a technical curriculum, they shouldn't try to limit themselves thinking that they don't have the ability or the acumen to, to go ahead and pursue flying. Yeah, one of my uh, squadron mates is a department head. He was an NFO also, but not only was he a music major, but he was actually a band director in the school system. So he was a you know an educator and decided at some point that you know I don't want to change a pace in life, and so he went off and joined the Navy and <laughs> became an NFO. <laughs> well, there you go. So all of you aspiring uh, young people out there want to do this, find something technical if you can, but don't give up if you don't. So awesome. All right, guys. Well, we can wrap this up. Niles, first off, thanks for uh, lending your expertise to this discussion today. Absolutely. Glad to be up here. Excellent. And Gersh, really appreciate your time and expertise and uh, good luck to Liam there. And we really do appreciate you helping out talk about the E2 Hawkeye. You bet. It's been awesome. Thanks, Jello. This is awesome. All right. Big thanks again to Gersh for taking the time out of his busy schedule and lending his expertise here today, as well as to you, Niles. Now, one Question slash correction. You said the E2D's radar can be electrically scanned, and I do this all the time. I think, did you mean electronically scanned? Yeah, yeah. Generally, people do call it uh, electronically scanned. It must have been a little brain bump uh, coming out there. (laughs) Uh, No problem. Well, that was a few months ago that we recorded it. I think we mentioned that it was late August, and we're rolling this in early December. Overall, I thought the uh, discussion was really compelling, and I learned a lot. Now, we ended up getting distracted, though, on the whole in-flight food thing. Now, let's get, you know, let's make sure we stick to the important stuff here. <laughs> right. What do you guys do? Do you have a little cooler or just everybody bring something if they want it? No, you pretty much limited to just like throwing an energy bar or a Snickers or something in your helmet bag and taking that with you. I did, though, once when I was a RAG instructor, I got to go on a flight with the uh, NATO AWACS while they were in town. And that was a little bit different experience. I was sitting there uh, in the console next to one of their guys. And next thing you know, I had this guy in a very prim and proper British accent asking me if I would like any chicken wings because they had prepared those (laughs) back in the little galley (laughs) back there. So we don't quite have that in the E2, though. Well, is part of that, you think, is it even maybe prohibited because they don't want things flying around on the cats and traps or anything? Honestly, there's just not any really room for anything like that. Huh. I know it looks like the plane is really big, but it is crammed full of boxes, and radios, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> all right. Now, another thing is we talked about the variants, but we kind of glossed over the different upgrades to the E2C. And so can you help me make sense out of that? As I recall, I think there was what, a Group Zero, Group Two, Hawkeye 2000. I don't know. Help me make sense out of all that, Niles. Yeah, and when we say E2C, that plane changed a lot from the time that it was first introduced. Uh, It came out to the fleet in 1973, so that's a pretty long time frame considering that we're just now upgrading to the E2D. Part of the reason there is that you know, one of the big expenses with trying to build up a new aircraft type is testing and and all that sort of stuff. So when you bring in a completely new series of aircraft, that induces a lot more testing requirements. So sometimes it's a a little bit safer, more conservative route to go from an acquisitions perspective to just kind of do incremental upgrades along the way. And that's really what happened to the E2C. 
the original one that they called groups, I doubt they called it group zero at the time because that was the only group there was, but the original one, it had a, uh, a little bit more primitive radar, didn't have a quite as good uh, clutter cancellation for overland operations as okay. the E2C got a little bit better in that regard. It also, if you ever see a picture of one, it's got kind of what you picture as like an old school, almost Vietnam era kind of radar scope to it. It's just a round thing with the monochrome green sweep going across and a faint little blip that you know disappears almost right away. There were symbols on it. You know, the computer would actually put out the symbols there to kind of keep track of where it thought things were. But it was a lot more primitive than what we got even with the Group 2 and certainly with the uh, Hawkeye 2000. When they came out with the Group 2, and actually there was a Group 1 in the middle there, but we didn't make too many of those. Okay. They upgraded the engines on the Group 1. If memory serves, there was a slight improvement to the radar, but it was one of those really subtle differences that wasn't really something that I think a lot of people outside the Hawkeye community would have uh, thought about too much. When we went to the Group 2, though, that brought in some more significant changes, uh, especially in the back end. So we had those upgraded engines, the uh, T-56A-427 instead of the 425 that was the original one. There were some other changes to it. And again, I never flew the Group 0. Well, I did like ride in the back of one once on a rag hop uh, as a student, but I never flew it in the fleet or anything. If memory serves, they did not have cross bleed starts on the group zero. So you actually had to hook the ground huffer cart up to each engine, you know, one at a time to start the engine. Now you can just hook up one engine, start it, and then cross bleed the bleed air over to the other side oh. to start the other engine. That saves a little bit of time on ground operations. Again, not, mm -hmm. not the most glamorous thing in the world, but it's the kind of thing <laughs> that certainly helps the flight ops okay. make them a little more efficient. But the big thing is that I think the air wing as a whole would care about is the fact that that's what brought in Link 16. And we were one of the first ones in the air wing to get it. Uh, really, I guess the first ones in the air wing. So we were primarily originally using it with the ships. The uh, F-14Ds had it, and eventually we brought in MIDS, which was just a miniaturized version of the Link-16 terminals, to all the other aircraft in the air wing. And that's really been something that's been happening over the last uh, you know, 10 to 15 years or so that we've gradually gotten to the point where everybody's got MIDS now. That was a big change. Uh, the fact that we've got color scopes in there now, that helps. You know, it just helps with uh, situational awareness when you can kind of color code things. It gives you, mm -hmm. you know, an extra dimension to realize what you're looking at. And then with the Hawkeye 2000, one of the big changes there was that brought in the cooperative engagement capability. And that is a real game changer for the strike group as a whole because now you can have, you know, one ship sharing raw radar information with another ship and fusing a picture together that can give you much better tracking than any one individual in the strike group has. Hmm. With Link 16, what you're doing is everybody is taking turns reporting something, but only one unit at a time is reporting anything. So it's either the ship is reporting it or the E2 is reporting it, but you don't have everybody all kind of working together collaboratively and saying, okay, I just got a hit on that guy. I got a hit, I got a hit. And then you wind up with an almost continuous track of the thing. So that kind of opens up, you know, some additional options there and improved tracking and everything for everybody. And having the E2 have that is also a game changer because now they're airborne at a higher altitude and can have a much broader look. And so two ships that might not be within line sight of each other now, all of a sudden, you've got a link that is in line of sight of both of them. And so you can really spread out and get a wider network going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the big changes there with the Hawkeye 2000. There's some other mission computer upgrades and stuff like that. Sure. I shouldn't say mission computer upgrades, but because that is technically the name of a certain upgrade. But the mission computer itself has been upgraded by going to that. Uh, and then when we get to the E2D, now you've got not just those changes, you've got the improved radar, and you've also got up in the front end, the ability with a glass cockpit there, they can actually bring right. the tactical display now yep. too. Like we talked about. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Is it safe to say, if I were to simply summarize the improvements, that it's gone from everybody has a little bit of information that they share to we're working towards, we're probably not there yet, but everybody knows everything and everybody knows what everybody else knows? Is that kind of where we're moving? That's the direction we're moving. I'm not sure if we'll ever be at the point where everybody knows <laughs> everything, course. but yeah, we're definitely moving to that point where it's not just, like I said, the taking turns, like I've got the load mm -hmm. uh, or he has the load, but now it's everybody kind of working together to uh, build up that collective situational awareness across the whole strike group. Okay. 
Now, I hate to admit this, Niles, but I forgot that you were on the Nimitz in 2004 with <laughs> Commander Fravor's yeah. incident. But has that had any impact on you or, or your notoriety or anything else like it has on him? A little bit, yeah. yeah? So I'm taking an executive MBA uh, program up at UCLA right now, and we got this big class-wide group chat, and somebody posted a link to an article about that. And uh, I jumped in on that and said, hey, I was on that flight. <laughs> and, Whoops. You know, and so immediately now... All of a sudden, uh, everybody perks up and wants to know all the details. And so they brought me on the uh, class podcast there to tell that story and everything. So, yeah. Just like we talked about. Yeah, that's good. Well, you're going to be making the rounds and uh, going to all the big podcasts soon. So stand by for that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and finally, and uh, as we begin thinking about wrapping up here, we asked Gersh what the future holds for him. But what's the future hold for you? You just got promoted. Yes, that's true. And uh, as sometimes happens uh, that way, when the Navy decides to do that, they say it's time for you to start doing something else. And just last week, I transferred over to uh, Carrier Strike Group 9, and I'll be the chief of staff there. Ooh. Yeah, that'll be another change, and uh, but it should be exciting. And, you know, one more uh, taste of salt air adventures and everything. Okay. So as the chief of staff for a Carrier Strike Group, you are what, the Admiral's right-hand guy? Yeah, pretty much. So as I know you know, but probably some of your listeners know, that the Admiral is in charge of the aircraft carrier, the air wing, the cruiser, the destroyers that uh, all sail together. Mm -hmm. And he has a staff of people that help execute those responsibilities to kind of make sure that collectively the strike group is working together, planning together, doing the things that we need to do to meet the tasking from higher headquarters, uh, depending on which fleet you're under the uh, operational control of at the time. And so that's my job is to be there and basically help run that staff and make sure that we're taking care of all that stuff so that the Admiral can uh, work together with the warfare commanders and come up with the strategic direction that we need for the strike group. Awesome. You think there's any chance you'll be able to jump in the back of an E2 once in a while doing that? I am hoping so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so that sounds like the kind of job that deploys, and I'm sure you've done a handful of those already. Any deployments in the future? Yes. As a matter of fact, time is uh, wrapping down uh, very quickly here uh, to get ready to go on a deployment. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit different now than the last time I went because of all the uh, COVID precautions that we have to take. Indeed, It has been eye-opening, only having been in that job for a week, though, but just looking at the level of complexity that is involved with planning it so that you can get those thousands of people that are in a strike group all together ready to go to sea and be confident that not a single one of them is curing the COVID virus. It's an interesting challenge. Yeah, they got to do a little bit of quarantine ahead of time, as I understand. So, yep. well, cool. So uh, good luck on that deployment. And thanks for spending a little time with us today to help better understand the E2 Hawkeye. Absolutely. Uh, glad to be able to do it. Well, before we wrap up today, I want to tell you about a hot new podcast I discovered recently. It's called The Low Level Hell Podcast, and it's hosted by Brian Harris, who joins us today via Zencaster. How's it going, Kesma? Hey, Jello. How you doing, man? Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no worries. Glad to have you. So tell me about this new show. Yeah. So like you said, it's called The Low Level Hell. It's partially an homage to the book by Hugh Mills about his experience as a scout pilot in Vietnam. But really beyond that, it's just dedicated to combat helicopter pilots of of all branches, all countries, just throughout the history of rotary wing combat. You know, really, that's the flight regime that we're used to working in, you know, down in the trees and the weeds, pushing stuff around. So we just wanted to have a show to kind of honor the memory of, you know, telling the stories and exploring the people and the machines, you know, kind of like what you do on your show, just with a rotary wing focus. Okay. And is that your background? Yeah. So I'm a uh, OH-58 Delta guy. Well, former, I guess. We got rid of them all and then transitioned over to Apaches flying the Echo models. So got about 15 years, a little over 2,000 hours flying helicopters, a couple of deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. So just kind of using some of that knowledge and, and really just same with you. I'm sure, you know, you meet people over time through your career. And even if you don't have interesting stories, you know people that do. So that's really what that's I want right. to capture is, is these guys and bring them on and really just expand the brand and talk to people, you know, reach back to Vietnam and reach back to some of the kind of strange things that happened in the 80s, you know, and talk about development and things. So that's the plan. Looks like you guys just got your start in October. A couple episodes on the books here. UAS discussion with Chris Herr, Helicopter Aerodynamics. What's on the docket? What's coming up? What can we expect? Next week, we should be releasing one. We're going to talk about Army Flight School. Then I've got some guys lined up to actually talk about Navy Flight School. So, you know, what I don't want to do is make this an Army show. I want to expand it across all rotary wings. So, you know, I know guys in the Coast Guard, guys in the Marines. So I really want to capture all their stories as well. And in the beginning, we we're trying to figure out what is the right 
tempo and, and what are the right topics. So right now we're just trying to hit the ground level and build up from there and, and talk about what it's like to be a helicopter pilot and then just expand as we go. Sounds good. Any surprises or any other uh, revelations in podcasting? I, it's not something that's difficult, but it's not easy to do well, I would say. Yeah, well, and I think you addressed it in one of your shows a while back. Audio is the number one challenge, I think, and just trying to get that right. Mm -hmm. But I'm lucky, and one of the guys on my team actually has some podcast experience. So he's got some equipment and some access to things, and he makes a, a good product great. So I'm, I'm happy to have him. Outstanding. All right, it's called the Low Level Hell Podcast. Where can we find it? It's all over the place. Uh, Apple, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Spotify, and then, uh, we have our own website, thelowlevelhellpodcast.com. If anyone wants to reach us or has questions, they can send it to the low level hell podcast at gmail.com. Outstanding. Well, good luck with the new show, Casmo, and uh, check back from time to time. Let us know how it's going. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jello. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, then this is the part in the show where we can begin to wrap up. We've got a little house cleaning business to take care of. First off, we want to thank our new Patreon air boss, Kevin Stinson. And remember, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So that'll do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Niles, thanks for your help again. And good luck on your upcoming deployment, my friend. Thank you very much, Jello. Appreciate it. All right. Well, let us know if you need anything while you're out there, and we'll make sure your family's all doing well back here. For everybody else, that'll do it. We'll see you back here next time on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com. Or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. 